know you're really busy and uh, you've been at work. CBRS has been a topic that we've been chatting amongst this batch on and our first batch as well. And so it's a pleasure and honor to have you join us today and kind of share your journey, both pre-CBRS Alliance at Nokia, your perspectives on how the, the industry is changing and, and sure. all that stuff. And so with that, I'd love to turn it over to you to introduce yourself. And it looks like you have some slides and maybe you can take us through that and then we'll jump into some questions. Yeah. Um, so, so first off, thank you. this is pretty good. Um, and uh, hopefully it will be informative for people. Uh, sure. So I'm going to put this on slideshow. I, I have no idea whether this is, uh, I've not really done this on uh, Teams before, but hopefully, does this, does this turn up okay? Looks perfect. Yep. Uh, okay, so so just just give you a bit of my background first. Um, so I actually was one of the founders of CBRS Alliance, and uh, I, I served as their chairman um, for two years. I I did that some of that while I was with Nokia. I ran strategy and business with Nokia for, and uh, as part of that. I did a lot of M&A for Nokia. Uh, I was the one that went to the Department of Justice to to explain why it wasn't anti-competitive for Nokia to buy Alcatel Lucent. Um, I did a couple of other deals. There's a there's a services company up in Chicago called SAC Wireless that um, I actually bought for Nokia as well. But generally, what I did was I I looked. Uh, where I thought the company could make an impact and uh, gaps in the market, things like that. Spent a lot of time with the U.S. See a lot of time with the U.S. government with the CBRS Alliance as well. Um, prior, I'll talk a bit about what we're doing now. But prior to that, uh, I actually did startups in California for the uh, best part of eight years. Uh, one of them was Turin Networks, which became Force 10, uh, which we actually sold to Dell. Um, the other one was Luminous Networks, which uh, I took over as their CEO uh, maybe 15 years ago or so. Uh, so I've done startups and uh, I, I had a really good time actually in startups. In fact, in the end, I wondered why I stayed in Nokia so long. And, but anyway, that's a, it's for a, a story for a different time. Um, as you can see, uh, this was actually a bio that Nokia and um, and the CBRS Alliance used, obviously not the words completely the same, but uh, the one thing that, that people did put down was that they put a picture of me and then made a note at the bottom that I actually didn't look like that in person, that that was taken about 20 years ago. So <laughs> that, was was <laughs> that was always very nice. Um, so in terms of, uh, I left 12 months ago. Uh, yeah, longer than that. Um, and the reason I left, the, one of the things I always wanted to do, I wanted to go back and do startups. I, I for all the, the stomach ulcer and everything else they gave me, uh, I actually did enjoy them. Um, I, I, one of the things that, that, I, that I really wanted to do address is that in the 4G world, everybody sort of, you, you got the big carriers built pipes and everybody else tried to take advantage of them and, you know, Google and everybody else did fantastic. YouTube did fantastic out of it. Um, in the five world, things are going to change. Um, but in but everybody talks about change, and the trouble is that the the enablers of change are not really uh, there in the market. And um, what I wanted to do uh, was was try and figure out how we we change things around. So if you look at the moment, 4G, 90% of apps developed are on an end user device. Um, they're, or they reside in the cloud with a very thin client on the device. But, but they, they're sort of agnostic to the network. I mean, they, they're either wireless net, they're either Wi-Fi, uh, 4G based apps or whatever, but they basically run over the top. Um, <clears throat> 5G is about taking advantage of the network and the network attributes. And um, what I wanted to do was to try and, and enable people to understand the opportunity and enable people to try and take advantage of it. Um, I am going to, to oh, I'm going to try and show a video. Uh, tell me, can you hear it? Yeah, slightly. Applications 
Chris, it is very hard to hear. Yeah, it's breaking um, up. Okay, well, let me let me do this then. Well, how do I change the volume on this? Do you have an external speaker? Here we go. You want right. to try this again? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, let's try again. Mm. Can't hear it anymore. <clears throat> Maybe, uh, Chris, if you'd like, you can um, share it with me over a Dropbox and I can send it to the team if, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, then basically, so so I'll give you the the, the summary of uh, of where it is. But basically what, what we, we I, I joined up with some uh, somebody else who founded Innovate 5G with me. And the whole idea was that we wanted to connect developers with the 5G world, but in a way that gave them access to it. And they didn't have to jump through the hoops of a carrier lab and all the other good things, which is why what you're doing, Jim, is fantastic, right? Because the world, the world of telecom and the world of, of AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and so on, is all about trying to, to pare everything down as fast as possible. It's all about it's all about trying not to waste their time whilst they develop and they innovate. And that that's sort of the antithesis of what should be happening on 5G. 5G is about everybody connecting with the opportunity and having a go. And so really what we, we looked at was creating a platform that connected people with 5G. And by that, it means that we, we created a platform that allows developers to put to have an idea, put it onto the platform, and we will actually connect it with a 5G lab and run it and give them feedback on how it performs, how they perform against somebody else. We will give them some ideas about how they can actually improve the performance of their application. And for carriers, the other thing we can do is we can look at the network slice, which is one of the things that's going to be big on 5G. And we can take the network slice and look at the right parameters that make a network slice optimum. So, so that that's what we're doing uh, on Innovate 5G. We brought some people into the company that know how to build networks and operate them because we wanted to sort of take all of that complexity away and, and manage that and give people the, the chance to just go take advantage of the opportunity. So that's... That's essentially what we're doing now on uh, Innovate 5G. I think the only other thing I'll say before we start and, we're, and then we can we can start the discussion is that um, I'll, I'll touch on CBRS. CBRS has been quite a success for 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 both the U.S. government and I think for industry. Um, we never we didn't see as many applications at the start that I wanted. We didn't see as many people apply for Spectrum at the start as I wanted, but um, we did see that uh, it was the most applicants for Spectrum that the FCC's ever had. It was the smallest um, uh, auction uh, areas that, that they've tried. So these were in counties, normally they're partial economic areas that they auction. Um, there were, they had a ton of, uh, just a ton of rounds that they did. Lots and lots of these got these counties, um, but we did get a lot of people. We did finally get people who were non-carriers get in there. So there are people like uh, industrials. There are petroleum companies that are in there. Um, you know, so guys that that we were hoping would come and and experience and and take advantage of the whole telecom piece actually did come uh, and engage. I think the you know the other part about it is that some of CBRS is licensed spectrum or semi-licensed spectrum. Some of it is actually open to anyone, and that part is getting used as well. So, you know, I I, th I think it's another piece of where I wanted to go, which is to create the 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 environment for opportunities for people. So with that, I'll give it. I'll pause and. Um. um so so. I want to add, to, add that to that for a second, for a second Chris. Chris. 
Sorry, guys. Sorry, there's guys, some there's background, some background noise. noise. If you're not you're speaking, not speaking we'll go on mute. Go on mute. Uh, uh, hold on. There's hold on, still. There's still some... Give me one second. Give me one sec, guys. Let's see if I can mute everybody. everybody. All right. And Chris, I'm going to unmute you. Chris, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, I think you should be back on. Okay. Perfect. I'm on. Perfect. Great. Great. Oh, oh, my friend, my it's, friend you. it's you. Maybe you. What am I doing? It's, it's, it's your, your, speaker. your speaker. There you go. There you go. Let's bring that there. Try that. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, so you, you, you mentioned that the, the, the auction, was auction was smaller than you anticipated. Than you anticipated. It, it, but it was four so billion dollars. Did you expect it to be bigger than that? The, the PAL option. No, I, 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 there was, there were, um, what was it? There were three hundred. I think there were three hundred applicants at the start. Got it. I wanted three thousand. Right. Right. So take us, take us, take us back. Take us back. I, you explained why the, the, the origin of the alliance came together, together. But take but us take back. Us back to why the FCC wanted to get into auctioning spectrum for private use. What was, what were they seeing as an opportunity? So, so um, if we go right back, the FCC were looking uh, at doing two things. Um, essentially, they were looking at trying to change the way they brought spectrum to the market because whenever you go clear spectrum and auction it in the traditional way, it's probably seven to nine years that it takes them to get through all that process. So they wanted to go through a process where essentially they speeded it up and this sharing process was the concept that they wanted to go for. Um, the, so, so one of it was speed to market. The other one was that they designated this to be an innovation zone. They wanted it to be an innovation ban they wanted to try and foster the idea that you would get lots of use cases that on their own were not going to be generated from from the traditional way that that networks were actually uh put out there and and consumed so innovation big deal getting spectrum to market for faster was a big deal the challenge was that the they could in going for a shared spectrum it meant that the incumbent, which was the Department of Defense, was going to stay there. And the Department of Defense had super user rights. Um, so we ended up having to create this really complex three-tiered structure, um, which I think we wouldn't do again. But the only thing I can tell you is that now that we've done it, how to do it, I think it makes any other sharing scheme uh, really easy. So, so I, I think people get really hung up about the three-tiered sharing and all the the ESCs and all the rest of it that we've got in there. But the truth is that we actually took a really difficult regimen and managed to create sharing opportunity in it. And it means that anything less than that's going to be a walk in the park. Uh, so. So I think I, I think from that perspective, that's really where where it is. But you know, go back to what I said when we first did this, and um, there was a there was a really interesting early on in the sense that the, there was about six of us that sat around a table at Intel and and came up with this idea of uh, the CBRS alliance. And when we first did it, it was. Uh, Google were pushing hard that this should be really everything but the traditional carriers that, that get the spectrum and it should be everything but them that goes to get make use of it. I think the the, the trouble is that that's a very that that's a very philosophical view because in reality, device ecosystems which you have to have to make this valuable, uh, radio access network systems and so on suppliers and all of those things, the only way that happens is that if if the people who buy lots of that equipment are involved, because then you don't get the investment from the devices, you don't get investment from the RAN and so on and so on. So in the end, I, I think a pragmatic approach uh, took, took hold. Um, you'll see that Verizon obviously have, have deployed a lot and they're, they're, they're fairly active in the band. I know T-Mobile are, Dish are. 
So some of the um, AT&T are active in the band. So you've got big guys that are active, but I think you still have lots of opportunity for other things to happen and other business models to happen. So I, I, I think we got, we sort of got to a really good place. Uh, it was a, it was a fascinating journey on the way through. Um, I did a lot of, the best part was I did a lot of talks with with some of the exe senior executives at Verizon right at the beginning. And so we were in, we were in New York and uh, talking to some investor groups and so on. And I go from that where it was essentially Verizon were talking about, you know, supplemental downlink and other things like that. And then I did a couple of talks with Preston Marshall of Google and Milo Medin of Google. And then they talk about scorching the earth on from carriers and doing and it was and, you know, you were sitting there and on one hand you were talking about how, well, yeah, we're going to we're going to embellish the whole user experience. And on the other hand, I'm standing there. And there was a meeting at IWCE or something in Vegas that I did, and we nearly had a riot in the place. Google just <laughs> went, Google just went nuts. I don't was, I had to keep trying calming him down. But anyway, yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. We, um, and and that whole that whole ecosystem. There's a hundred and I think there's 160 companies in that alliance now. Um, I know there's over a hundred. Um, in, in CBRS that, that support that. So it, it's, it has taken off, mm -hmm. but it's still there for people to go, go, go get some opportunity for themselves. When, uh, when, uh, one time a little while ago, Chris, Chris I, think I think I heard you mention, mention a, figure a figure of how much, how much this, this uh, move, uh, move in the market, in the market for CBRS is going to impact the GDP. It was, it was a pretty a novel number. number. Yeah. Oh gosh. I, uh, um, I, it was tens of billions. Um, it's tens of billions is the market impact. We've had some guys uh, do do some work on that. I mean, obviously the 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 auction itself raised four or five billion or whatever it was, but the actual GDP impact is how much it's going to create in terms of jobs and uh, an impact to the economy. And uh, the forecast is that in the next five years it'll create somewhere near 100 billion of impact to the economy right. and that you know that that's not that's not changed that's not bad for for where we started so i think it I speaks, think it to, speaks the, to the the bigger opportunity bigger beyond even just connectivity one of the one other, of the other big opportunities i think it does help it with is um enterprise private, private network, network which we'll touch yes. on yes yeah, but I, I, I am. You know this you better know this than better I do, Chris. Chris. I think, I think the, sequence the sequence was the CPRS, the CPRS Alliance, Alliance started, started down, down its pathway, pathway here in the United, in the United States, States, which became, became sort of like, sort of like a, a, the the bellwether, bellwether for other, other countries, countries to do something, do something similar. similar. I've heard <coughs> efforts, efforts in Germany, in Germany and, other and, and, other and other countries as well. Is that is that the way this played out? Do you think CPRS Alliance will essentially expand the world and markets as well? So so great question. So what actually is going to happen is, uh, so first off, yes, that is what happened, is the, the United States started off on CBRS. Uh, we were due to do this a lot faster than, than we turned out. <laughs> um, unbelievable delays from the US government, but, but anyway, it, we got there in the end. In the meantime, you've got the UK have done something on private spectrum holdings. Germany in particular has done something at 3.7. Um, you, you've seen you've seen this this start to move. I we get a lot, and I get a lot of questions from elsewhere. How it works? What are the key ingredients? I think the biggest issue for the regulators is that they think their only job is to make Spectrum available. And you, the trouble is that you can make Spectrum available, but if you don't have an ecosystem to take advantage of it, it won't go anywhere. Um, and in Germany, I think they're finding this out. Uh, in the UK, they, they're finding it out. Um, what we what we are going to do, and I, what I think you're going to see is, I think you'll see the CBRS alliance will change. It'll become the Ongo alliance. Um, and I think you'll see that it won't be re restricted to the CBRS band it, it will move out of the ba out of that band into other shared spectrum bands in the United States, and it, it will have a remit to to support sharing of spectrum 
uh, in other countries as well. That's fantastic. So, so what, well, I looked at I looked the at results, the results from, from the Pell license, license auction, license auction in, 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 I think it was June or July. July. It was 4.2 billion, billion, I think. I, think. I did a yes. tear down yeah. of the biggest, the biggest vendors. vendors. And Verizon, 1.8 billion share, share of that. that. I think the dish came, came in at 900, 900 million. million. Yes. Uh, but then there was then about there was 170, 170 million, million that, that in my very my quick tear down, I, I, I noticed a combination, combination of either universities, universities public, public utilities, utilities, or private, or enterprises. private enterprises. So my, yeah. next, yeah. my next question is, is, is of all, all of the of opportunities, opportunities that licensing this band will enable, I think it's starting to light the early private networking for enterprise opportunity as well. Is that something to seek too? Yeah. So, so one thing just to the the uh, hopefully the people know this, but but in the case that they don't, the CBRS band is 150 megahertz of spectrum. Um, there's 70 megahertz of that that's called PAL, PAL, Priority Access License. That is what was sold by the FCC in 10 megahertz chunks. That all sits at the lower end of the spectrum. That sits at the sort of 3.55 and up. There's another 30 megahertz on top of that that's sort of there to, to allow people to move because that the PAL actually sits where the US Navy happens to operate. So that's one of the areas where the spectrum sharing is going to be active. In other words, people are going to move around a little bit in that area. And there's 30 megahertz on top of that that's in there that allows that. The rest, the other 50 megahertz that sits just below 3.7, that's what's called GAA, General Availability Access. Anybody can go into that. Anybody can use it. You have to get connected to a SAS, but anybody can go use it, and you don't have to pay. Now, the, the other part to mention about this is that the way the rules are designed is that if you're not interfering with a PAL, you are a GAA. And by that, what that means is that if you're operating inside a building where there's good isolation from outside, uh, so the loss at 3.5 in build, the building loss itself is high, you are probably able to operate and gain access to most, if not all, of the spectrum inside the building, regardless of whether it's in the GAA or the PAL, you're probably able to get access to most of it. So it, the opportunity indoor is huge. Um, the opportunity in outdoor, um, one of the other things I would uh, I tell you that we I, I'm doing at the moment is the uh, in response to COVID, um, schools went to partial online. You know, they did this uh, sp in some of the states. They did this three days uh, online, two days in class, which sounds really good until you find out that in fact, 35% of your kids don't have uh, internet, which means those three days they don't get educated. Um, so one of the things that the uh, I'm doing at the moment with some school districts is we're building networks where they're based at the elementary schools and radiating to the local neighborhoods and creating fixed wireless access for for kids who, who don't have it. And some of the areas, as I say, I, the one area that we're dealing with, 30, I think it's 37% of the kids don't have internet access. So without doing this, they don't actually have any way of continuing with the schooling. So um, so I, I think I think what uh, what we're saying here is that you know there's there's lots of opportunities outdoor indoor there's power utilities doing it there's there's maybe um, some of these industrial plants that are going to do it there's probably a lot more spec a lot more opportunity than people and I think people have to get to grips with the, what the rules are and how you use it. Okay. Okay. So, so given, given your, your long history at Nokia and before that as well, the the 4G to 5G transition arguably is a big one, right? And I'd love to get your perspectives on on why you think it's, let's say, bigger than tradition or the transitions we've seen in the past from 3G to 4G and why this is a maybe maybe an inflection point in the industry itself, if you think that if you think that. I, I so I think I think it could be is the truth. I think it could be an inflection point. I think the it, there's no guarantee it will be. Um, 
I think the only way, so essentially 5G is really about the fourth industrial revolution. That that's That's what it's all about. It's about, it is about doing everything that isn't, you to stream a cat playing a, a piano at lightning speed, right? The right. the consumer piece is somewhat tapped out because we all we've got used to fifty bucks a month or you can eat. Getting it faster is is not going to raise the ARPU from from consumers, and so the the real value of five G and the and the five G attributes whether it's ultra low latency high reliability extreme mobile broadband or or whether massive machine connect those attributes are are really good in terms of enabling what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution and that means you know latencies of less than one millisecond. So control of machinery is is now within our grasp wirelessly. And that makes a big difference. I was talking to, to Verizon yesterday, and that makes a massive difference if you're creating a factory where the lines are not static, where you have to retool every so often. If you, if you just static, then fiber it up because it doesn't make any sense. But if you're moving assets around, it makes a ton of sense. So... For that, it, control loops now become very, very fast, and it means that robotics and so on becomes very, very, very real. I think, you know, you've seen a lot of people look and talk about autonomous and things like that. I think whether they become public road vehicles or not, I don't know, because I'm not sure we're all ready to, to trust a network to keep our cars from running into each other, but... I think there's tons of other places like warehousing and so on where you see autonomous vehicles and you'll see 5G get used. Um, I, I think the medical area is is huge. Um, you know, we, we've talked to hospitals uh, and so on where, again, it's whether it's whether it's remote diagnostics on medical, whether it's um, what they do in the hospital itself in terms of moving assets around and having good inventory on those assets, um, whether it's whether it's remote surgery. Again, I, I don't I don't know whether I'm quite ready for that one yet. But uh, you know, people are the, the it's 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 the world of the possible is opening up. But the world of the possible is about things that are beyond just connecting you and I. It's the world of the possible is 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 about a massive universe that that we've opened. And go back to what I said on right at the beginning. And the the thing about Innovate 5G is the the world of the possible is there. But if we don't actually see people take advantage of it, it's not going to happen. And right. <clears throat> it means you've got to break the current the current sort of fill, funnel and filter for how it happen. You've got to break that open and you've got to allow mass innovation. And, you know, it's and one of the things about the, 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 the way you look at the, the innovation funnel and the way it's been done up until now, you know, it's all been about trying to continue things down and, and, and make sure that you're investing in things that continue to build to a to a final outcome. I think you've got to blow that up and just let people have a go and let and you know it's a Darwinian thing. Some of them are going to do really well and lots of them aren't. But you've right. got to get to that position. You've got to get mass adoption, and that's what will make 5G go. It, it'll be when we create that, and you know that's why again, the things that you guys are trying to do there in Seattle. I, I just think it's such an important part of what's got to happen to make 5G real. Right. Um, I, I do. I, I think without that, um, you know, I, I also think there's an education piece, by the way. I think the problem is that we've got tons of guys that have got great ideas. we got kids coming out of school with just fantastic ideas, but they've got no way to connect to, to what the opportunity is in 5G. And, you know, 5G and and you look at the thousands of people you see in a carrier that that basically have all the intellectual property and so on and know it. And that's daunting for a, a developer. I mean, you know, trying to sift your way through that lot and so on. So, 
you've got to try and, and flatten that all out and take all that away, that complexity away, and leave them with the idea that they can create great business outcomes and create great value, and, and it's in their hands. And I think if we can do that, then we'll get then then you'll just get the flood of ideas that I think is necessary to really take advantage of 5G. You know, Chris, um, you hit on something that that's that's really interesting. The other day, I had heard from a colleague over at the Department of Defense um, that the the single biggest enterprise in the United States that is out investing anyone in 5G is the Department of Defense. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've been on record spending hundreds of billions of dollars on. 5G test beds and other efforts. Uh, one of which I think is is close to home for Innovate 5G with Texas A&M. Yeah. Would you mind talking a little bit about your partnership with Texas A&M and the interplay yeah. of that with Phoenix? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so Texas A&M is building um, a test bed called Relis, which is at an old Air Force base just outside of College Station. Um, the idea that, that so they have a partnership with the Army Future and uh, Department of Homeland Security and others. Um, so the idea is that they're creating a test site for basically autonomous vehicles and things like that, but they're, they're going to put up uh, a sort of six to eight radio uh, 5G test bed. Um, in conjunction with that, they have a lab in College Station, which we actually uh, work on for them. Uh, and that's that that was originally 4G. It's going to 5G. And we we connect our Phoenix platform to their lab. And the intention is that the Phoenix platform will get connected to Relis on top. Um, now, is that, a, is that an environment a standalone millimeter wave 5G environment or is it non standalone CBRS? So it uh, so what they have is the they will have standalone um, hopefully again not not to get too too deep into this but the issue is that network slicing is only really available in standalone if you go to non standalone network slicing doesn't doesn't really apply and i think the the real opportunity is through network slicing so there they will have a standalone um test bed um you know it, i mean like everything it was going to have to be non-standalone when they started because their plan was to actually deploy it quite some time ago. Um, uh, they they couldn't get out their own way, and I hate to say that because I'm sure it will get back to them, but they couldn't get out their own way, so they probably end up with a standalone now because they, they've delayed so much. But they the whole plan was always to go standalone. Okay. Um, I have talked to the D Department of Defense a couple of times, um, and... I, I mean, you're absolutely right. The Department of Defense um, have essentially got a massive budget. The the thing I've talked to the Department of Defense about is the fact that I said, look, the problem is that you're going to appear, approach this from the same way that you've done everything else. You're going to round the usual suspects up, have a bidding process. They will build whatever you they will build what you ask for at your at your bases. And as long as you ask for it, you'll probably get it. But what you won't get is you won't get people coming and creating things new that you didn't ask for, but were really surprised about. And if you don't, and if you want to see that side of innovation, the part that isn't dependent on you thinking of it all up yourself, then don't go do what you're going to do. However, they did it. Um, and, you know, what are they going to get? They're going to get a bunch of test beds run by General Dynamics, Boeing, uh, you know. There, um, built by people that build good networks, but they build networks for what you can do today, and uh, that'll be that'll be what they get constrained with. And uh, you know, I I I think with Texas A and M, the one thing that that we have to do in Texas A and M is we have to operate in a very secure regimen, okay? Because um, DHS uses it and so on, so. There's a security layer on top of everything that we're doing. Um, and I, I did try and say to them that, that, you know, I think that that creates your opportunity to bring other people in and bring other in innovation in. You can handle the security um, and we can handle those problems. But if you don't handle them, it is going to be the reason you don't get the innovation you want. And, um, yeah, I, at this point, 
they're going to get exactly what they asked for, and that's it. Well, on that on that point, Chris, one of the you know we're um, so this morning, guys, we we've been uh, partners with Innovate 5G for several months, uh, but this morning we signed a partnership agreement with them because they are helping us deploy and think through and plan our Snowco uh, Swan Trails testbed. And so on that note, Chris, I wanted to use it as an opportunity to say with that we we look forward to our partnership and creating a, an open platform in Swan Lake, in Swan Trails rather that allows that innovation to happen. And maybe that becomes a, a proof point over time for others to kind of look at that innovation and then maybe take that model and replicate it elsewhere as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think I think the measure that, that's worth just having in our minds is how how well utilized that becomes and how many people because because reality is with the way that you we can build 5g networks we can actually batch run tons of applications at the same time and yeah. get good data on how they perform so you know um i think the measure of success in my mind is just how much we we create opportunity for innovation and how many people want uh, understand that it's there and come and take advantage of it yeah. and uh you know as i say i was i did a call yesterday um with with one of the larger telcos about some of their um 5g installs and uh they because of the way they do it they're not going to get the innovation that they hope you know yeah. um and i think that you've got to be open you've you've got to have a different mindset and i think helps that that you and the companies that you've got are coming from a different angle um i i think that will be quite a challenge for the industry and i you know i that's the sort of thing i think we really do have to push and and try and make happen yeah ag agreed our friend bupesh from intel had a question for you i think you sure um may have met bupesh in the past but bupesh did you want to ask, ask your question yeah. Hi, Chris. Thanks for hey. your time. Very informative. Um, I have a quick question. So as we see these, uh, especially the CBRS-based private networks or in general, the CBRS-based network, there are primarily four use cases. One is uh, mobility off-road, like uh, what Verizon, yep. uh, Charter, Comcast are targeting. The second one is a neutral host solution that these real estate guys are targeting, right? Uh, the third one is what Jim was talking about, the private wireless with enterprise. And the fourth one is what you kind of like re referred about the fixed wireless networks with respect to like whether these VISPAs, the wireless infrastructure providers, as well as the in the rural and suburb area. Uh, most of the press uh, is covering the private wireless with enterprise. It seems like uh, I think it's a natural fit, right? Everyone is talking about like how this is uh, changing the industrial revolution and all. But where do you see in these four main use cases, other than this private wireless with enterprise, where do you see this more and more adoption? And the you guys were working about like the and envisioning about the whole CBRS adoption. Uh, who are these other big players that you think in the long term uh, among these four uh, use cases? So, so first, first off, um, I think uh, you absolutely right on the on the use cases. A good grouping, um, enterprise. The enterprise opportunity was one that was being followed really big time. I mean, um, I don't know if you know them, but there's a there's a really large private equity firm called. Brookfield that own 500 billion of assets in the United States. And uh, I spent a lot of time with them this time last year, uh, trying to figure out how they start to create better connectivity and manage solutions for their own, for, for getting better fill and better rates on their property. And lots and lots of that has happened. But the trouble is that COVID absolutely stalled that because people don't go in, right? suddenly the the whole spending on on enterprise um sort of stopped and i think the that it will come back obviously once we get past covid assuming that we haven't changed our behavior on how we want to work but assuming we still actually want to to physically meet people and we've not become totally antisocial uh i think we will see that 
the the fixed wireless access became more of a of an immediate need because suddenly the idea that you've got people that aren't connected and they can't actually get out that that was a real problem so we saw a lot of that um you see a lot of that by the way outside of cbrs in bam 41 in the ebs spectrum with tribal nations they they're looking at that to try and alleviate some of their problems so i think fixed wireless access definitely became a hot topic i don't know how much it will it, i think it's one of those that peaked and it'll have a long tail and it will continue to go because against the 1400 bucks that the homes pass that fiber costs uh fixed wireless access provided can provide the right um uh, uplink downlink speeds is still a really good solution um i think on the on the others when you look at say um the supplemental downlink i think you're already seeing all of that happening so you've got a lot of deployments that are out there going right now on supplemental downlink um I think Verizon are building out, as I say. I know that some of the others are building out as well. You saw Dish uh, have bought Spectrum as well. So I think you'll see that sort of more traditional view because there was just a dearth of Spectrum in the mid-band. Um, in terms of, I, I, I think, you know, the trouble is that people keep, people want to know, people ask a lot about, well, what's the killer use case and so on. And the fact is that if, if we'd have sat down and we knew it, we probably wouldn't have been working for the companies we would. We'd have gone and done it. I, I think the killer application is going to, or the killer applications are going to come from people who have great ideas and understand how to apply them. You know, P, I go back to YouTube and other things. You know, we weren't very good at seeing those things coming. We created inadvertently we created the opportunity and people took advantage of it now we're trying to create the opportunity and we're trying to make sure that people understand it's there and i think you know that's the excitement for me is not to to try and manage who gets what and manage how it grows but to try and open up the opportunity and just let anybody have a go whether it's the guy who's in his in a sophomore at university or whether it's a big company somewhere around the the country i think that's that's what's going to be fascinating and is that we're moving away from the idea that we're about telecom and we're moving towards the idea that we're about creating uh, an outcome uh, a something of value and you know we're in a world in telecom where any everybody will tell you that the only thing that matters is the telecom because that's where it's been since since 1900 and frozen to death right and nothing else has ever mattered um and we we're getting to we're we're seeing commoditization of telecom that's hitting here and so on but we're getting further and further away from the from the bolts of telecom being the underlying key attribute to the idea that it's creating value from a service or an application or whatever it is, is the, is the real end outcome. And you see that because you look at the stats, right, in, in, an, um, in a connection, I think a couple of years ago, we looked at this, it's sort of, uh, I think it was like 86 or 90% of the value of, of all the connections was actually derived from people who were going over the top and had nothing to do with the infrastructure. And, you know, the guys in the infrastructure kept looking at that and going, well, I've got to stop them. I've got to put a wall fence around them and do all this. And I think they've given up, right? I, I honestly do. I think they've given up on that. And now they have to be, they have to be bold and they have to be brave and, and, and actually uh, get in and, and entertain the idea that they're going to be part of this, this whole innovation ecosystem. So speaking of bold and brave, a third rail topic that I've stepped into several times is, is ORAN. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that right. is a given, real bold, that's uh, a real it, bold well, and brave one. Yes. Given your roots at Nokia, um, and they've embraced ORAN as of late. I've been seeing more and more noise about that, at least. Publicly, but, yeah. um, not ORAN specific, but similar issues, the, the competing perspectives on open source versus commercial software in my days at Microsoft, whether it was 
uh, Windows Phone versus an Android, uh, orig originally an open source project, well, it still is, uh, whether it was Windows and Linux and whatever variants and whatever you know platform, there's been these competing notions. But it looks like from my vantage point that, that ORAN is not a fleet by night idea. I think it's actually building a much more momentum in the ecosystem. I'd love to know if you had an opinion on that, given your time at the CBRS Alliance, previously your time at Nokia, where you yeah, think yeah. that's going. So I... Um... So again, ORAN happens to be something that I, I, I've spent a lot of time with the US government on as well. Right. Um, so ORAN is the ultimate commoditization of telecom. Um, and um, you, you obviously have the, the, the dynamics involved there. The, the people that would never have invested in becoming a telecom player won't uh, see ORAN as a way to actually get in because it breaks all the barriers that, that were there. The people who are resident in it don't want it to happen very quickly because they think that it opens up competition and erodes their margin and their top line. So I think you've got a very rational response there. You'll see all the big guys say that they're going to do ORAN if they're smart, they'll say they're going to do ORAN and they'll try and manage how it comes. And they'll it isn't coming very quickly at all. Along the way, they'll try and make it bespoke if they can, um, if if no one knocks that down. Um, but And then you'll get the other guys coming in and, go, and trying to just disrupt. Um, and I think if in a normal ecosystem world, that probably wouldn't have been as successful as it's going to be. But one of the dynamics that's going to change things is the, the US government in particular feels that ORAN is the way to break the current cycle on telecommunications. And they want to do that because fundamentally you've got three guys, the three, four guys that run telecom um, One's in Finland, one's in Sweden, one's in Korea, and one's in China. And the US government was lobbied ad, uh, extensively over the fact that if this is a, taken away from being a bespoke integrated issue, and it's more of a common platform software issue, then the United States is one of the leaders, if not the premier place for software development and software and if you do that, tons of companies will come in and, and the U.S. Will, will, will start to regain its dominance. Um, and there are big companies that are in your, uh, uh, that are part of your, your effort who've, who've done a lot to, to try and explain why they're, they're going to help support this to happen. And I think that that fundamentally, and it's not a Democrat Republican thing, by the way. I think it's a it's across the aisle the whole issue. But I think the that push, on top of the fact that at the end of the day, ORAN and its fundamental suggests that you're going to get commoditization of the infrastructure and lowering of costs for the likes of Verizon and AT and T and so on. So they probably look at it and think, well, okay, this is this is a pretty good idea for us as well. I, I think it's an inevitability now. Um, I think the speed of it is going to be, we'll all overestimate how fast it'll happen because that's always the way we do it. We'll, we'll think it's going to happen really quickly and then we'll find out it gets dripped in. Um, I think the other thing that you've got to look at is the fundamentally in ORAN, one of the things that that's happened in carriers generally is that they moved the the concept of integration away from their own purview and moved it to the suppliers when you get to oran suddenly that burden has to be borne by somebody and the people that you'd want to bear that burden are the guys that probably aren't going to push oran that fast so now you've got a hole you need you need something really credible um that meet the sort of conservative nature of, of the major carriers' decision-making um, and can actually support the concept of how to integrate and, and service assure the overall network. And I think that, that part, I, I mean, if anybody looked at what happened with DISH, right, um, they, they scoured around, tried to persuade all sorts of the major guys to, to actually take that role, and they didn't. And I think they got Fujitsu to do it in the end. But 
you know that that's that's one of the areas that has to be tackled so so from my perspective i think it'll happen it's 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 a bit of an inevitability it's just how Unknown fast it happens is, is going now to be exiting. is is going to be the issue thank you chris and I, um i i think you're spot on the insight you just shared is, is perspective for me i've been pouring over as much as I can where the ORAN alliance and that whole effort is going. But thanks for sharing that inside uh, perspective based on what you've seen. Sriram from Gen XCOM had a question. So Sriram, do you want to, and this will be our last question for, for sure. today, but Sriram, did you want to go ahead and ask? Yes, yeah, Chris. Uh, by the way, good morning. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, so I'm with Gen XCOM and we have taken the main reason this whole topic of ORAN is very close to our heart. We are, um, we're an indifference cancellation company that's built more IAB and, and mesh nodes, essentially, as a go-to-market strategy that plays nice with both a um, non-ORAN and an ORAN architecture. Yep. We have tried to um, you know, work with traditional CIPRI and eCIPRI architectures because we do a, a repeater relay IAB architecture. So now, <clears throat> but obviously we are pretty passionate on the ORAN side. Um, we've we've worked to uh, um, better understand how to position ORAN in a way, and and many of it comes from ORUs, as you mentioned, Fujitsu and the like, to really make that uh, scalable um, architecture in a way that would work well with uh, multiple CUDUs and so on. So uh, a, a lot of this is still the wild west for us. Um, yep. Working to. Uh, see how, as a small company, we can work with some of these vendors to uh, follow some strict 7-2 split guidelines and uh, and still work nicely with non-7-2 split guidelines. So it's it's yes. been it's been a balancing act, right. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it it is. Uh, what you're saying is resonating very much with where the market is. Uh, do you think that? If we played a good balancing act, there's a chance for both to work. I mean, uh, of course, not, the folks that want to drag it out will drag it out. But is there a, enough niche market in which ORAN can still survive given the market is big enough? So, so look, uh, I, I mean, ORAN will grow. It's just the speed at which it grows, okay? Um, so I, I think the, there's enough market for, for companies to actually make it in. The the one the one uh, this is a bit of a tangential comment, but I, I'll I'll make it anyway. I think when you look at it, right, as a as a small company in a market, your value is to push the technology boundaries, is to push, is to push the whole envelope. Okay, doing the same thing as everybody else has done for since since the year dot is the thing that Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung do like you you wouldn't believe. And yeah. they're very low risk. And so I, I think, you know, that that's the whole thing that people like about small companies, startups, or whatever, is the, is the go for it mentality. And if there's a cliff there, you're going to run off of it rather than walk up and peer over the edge, right? And I, I think that's where ultimate value is going to happen. And I think the our conservative nature always plays in and we get all worried about whether we're taking the right risks or whatever. But the fact is that, you know what, if we're not taking the risk to create something new and push the envelope, we're, we're trying to say that we can out, we can out sort of uh, me, mediocre the likes of Nokia and Ericsson and so on. And they are masters at being mediocre. You're not going to beat them at doing that, right? It's just <laughs> not going to happen. Agreed. So, so Agreed. don't be mediocre. Be something. Be something more than that, and and have the guts to go for it. Because eking an existence out off the scraps that they leave from dinner is is not. It's just a miserable thing in my mind. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I, I share that same point of view heavily. Uh, either go big or go home. You know, you, you want to make a difference. Um, yeah. Doing something, doing something mediocre here or there doesn't make it doesn't bend the curve at all. And five G no. opportunity, it, this is a once in a decade opportunity to actually do something that is not mediocre. So I I, I, I agree heavily with you there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Shreem, for the question. <clears throat> Chris, 
I know you've had a, a pretty pretty heavy start to your morning with that earlier board meeting, and now with us as well. And so I wish I was close by to hand you a beer and thank you for your time. But, um, <laughs> hey, this really... was this this was really good. I believe it or not, the board meeting before Oran was the was the topic. So yeah, <laughs> that was well, why sorry, it was quite fresh. Sorry to bring you back uh, to because, that. I, yeah. Because they were all keen on being mediocre as well, and we we <laughs> had a bit of a, a clash about that. Uh, but anyway. Well, hey, thank you so much, Chris, for, um, for one, being a partner for us here in the lab, for imparting your knowledge and, and your perspectives. We, uh, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you again. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I, this is good. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that. And guys, thanks for listening in. As always, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank all right. you. Cheers. See you later. Thanks all. All right. Bye. Cheers.